This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. I want to welcome everyone. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself. I am Margaret Schoeninger, one of the co-directors of CARTA, along with Ajit Varki from the School of Medicine, and Rusty Gage, who is from the Salk Institute, and was very sorry he could not be here today. I would also like to introduce our associate director, Pascal Gagneau. We all welcome you and are very pleased to see you here today for what we think will be a very exciting symposium. I just wanted to uh, explain a little bit about what we are and what we do. CARTA is the Center for Advanced Research and Training in Anthropogeny, and anthropogeny is a term used for the investigation into the origin of humans, and the person organizing the symposium today, Dr. James Moore, will be um, just talking very briefly about the origin of humans and some very exciting new um, discoveries today that have just been released today. CARTA is, has a particular mission, and I just wanted you to tell you our mission statement. That is that we use all rational and ethical approaches to seek all verifiable facts from all relevant disciplines, and I think uh, you can see I'm from anthropology, Ajit is from the School of Medicine, uh, Rusty Gage is from SOC. Uh, we are from all across the map. We are from all relevant disciplines to explore and explain the origins of the human phenomenon. I want to give a special thanks to our major sponsors, uh, the G. Harold and Lila Y. Mathers Charitable Foundation, and especially to the director of that foundation, Mr. James Handelman. I'd also like to thank Annette Merle Smith, who has helped with um, funding these symposia. So I will... Um, Turn this now over to Dr. James Moore, who is the organizer of this symposium on culture as a phenomenon across various animal species. Well, welcome to this uh, symposium on human and non-human cultures. In a review of the, the concept of culture in 1952, uh, Krober and Klockholm came up with 162 different definitions of culture. Uh, I imagine that in the last 50 plus years, we've probably come up with a few more rather than uh, reduce the number. Today, uh, I think we're going to use a fairly, well, we'll use a number of definitions, I'm sure, but fairly broad ones in order to illuminate the functions of this uh, nebulous concept and then in particular to see what sets us apart from uh, our, our culture apart from the behaviors that are apparently culture-like in non-humans. Uh, I want to set the scene for this with uh, a little episode in the study of uh, the evolution of, uh, of human uniqueness, and that has to do with uh, vervet monkey uh, alarm calls. Apart from man, no other animal in the wild has been shown to use so many different word-like alarm calls. A call that means danger from the air. And the vervets run into the denser branches where the eagle won't pursue them for fear of damaging its wings. From the safety of the thorny branches, the vervets scream furiously. 
and one is even brave enough to launch a lightning attack. Monkeys are not the only ones to be fearful of the eagle. So are small birds, such as the superb starling. Vervets understand the starling's vocabulary. The bird shrieks a warning, shh, danger on the ground, and the monkeys repeat it using their own term, and everyone runs for it. So vervets, with such a wide vocabulary of alarm calls, show that sound can carry a great deal of vital information. This wide variety, mind you, is three different alarm calls. And uh, for that, vervet monkeys made it into most of the textbooks. Uh, if you've had biological anthropology, anthropology you've had a, something like this where it talks about the language capacities of humans. And then, well, of course, it all starts with vervet monkeys. Um, a few years after, this is the, the vervet work was published in Science in 1980 and Animal Behavior in 1993, we had um, an avian uh, example. <laughs> Oddly, this paper has not made it into the textbooks <laughs> <laughs> and is not as widely known, uh, maybe because they only have two different uh, predator alarm calls rather than three. The message here is that if we're trying to understand the human phenomenon, it's a mistake to stop at our closest relatives um, because if we do that, we miss out on behaviors that are at least functionally similar in other taxa that can help us by looking at that functional similarity also then pay attention to the mechanism is the chicken alarm call learned in the same way that a vervet alarm call is learned? Is it shaped uh, in the same fashion? Uh, the ontogeny of the uh, uh, call during development, and also the phylogenetic history, which is of interest to us. So by, uh, by looking across a wider variety of uh, species, I hope to, to um, encourage uh, the approach to looking at all four of these levels of explanation, these types of explanation, to better understand what is it that really makes ours uh, quite different. It is a real pleasure to be back, not the least because the question of how animal cultures and human cultures are related or might be related has been an interest of mine dating back to when I was a graduate student here at UCSD and taking classes with Jim. And the work that I'm going to describe today on vocal dialects in the yellow naped Amazon started at that time and has continued to be one of the foci of my research to this day. Like uh, all the speakers so far today, I feel it's important to define what I mean by culture, but since my definitions aren't particularly different than those that have gone before, and indeed uh, Susan is one of the authors of the definition of tradition, I'm not going to belabor the point other than to point out the importance of social learning and to point out that my particular interest today is going to be in traditions that are produced by vocal learning, that is, uh, the learning of the vocal communication repertoire from others. Now, we humans tend to think of vocal learning as common because we, in a few relatively well-studied taxa, rely heavily on it. And it's interesting that although it is certainly widespread, it is absolutely not ubiquitous. There are lots and lots of groups among uh, mammals and birds that do not have it. Those that do uh, include, of course, humans and the cetaceans that we'll hear about later. There's also recent evidence that uh, bats and elephants are capable of some forms of vocal learning. Uh, but it's not as clear that our non-human primate relatives uh, either are capable of learning or are capable of it, certainly not to the extent that humans are. And of course, these uh, groups are very phylogenetically distantly related, and there are lots of groups that are close relatives uh, within mammals that are not closely related. Uh, likewise, in birds, we see a similar pattern. So the Ossian songbirds, uh, like this robin here, rely on uh, vocal learning to learn songs. But their closest relatives, the sub ossian songbirds, uh, for the most part, don't seem to do that. There are reports of learning in hummingbirds, and of course, parrots are well known for their vocal learning ability. 
And again, the most parsimonious explanation in both mammals and birds is that vocal learning has evolved independently multiple times. Now one common manifestation of vocal learning or uh, vocal are vocal traditions that are known as dialects. So these are very common, uh, they described in taxa with vocal learning. They, in birds, they've been a uh, focus of active research dating back to Marler and Tamura's article in 1964 in Science in which they described vocal dialects in the male song of white-crowned sparrows. So here are uh, six calls, uh, s songs, sorry, recorded up north of San Francisco Bay in the Marin County area, and they're all very similar in structure. These are spectrograms here with time along the x-axis and frequency along the waveform. So this is the frequency patterning of the call itself. Here are six uh, songs recorded in Berkeley, and they're very different from six songs recorded south of the bay in uh, Sunset Beach. Despite an extensive amount of research over the last 45 years, many questions still remain uh, relatively poorly understood about dialects, including uh, how do they arise in the first place, uh, and why are they seen in some taxa and not others? What contributes to the persistence and stability of dialects in some taxa? And in other taxa, why do dialects seem to evolve or change uh, on some temporal time scale? And finally, and perhaps most importantly, what, if any, are the benefits to individuals of conforming to these vocal traditions? Uh, my research is focused on parrots, and I uh, had a long slide to tell you why, but actually Susan did my work for me. When she described uh, taxa that might be interesting to look at for vocal traditions, I think she went through many of these characteristics that are exhibited by parrots. Of course, there are lots of them, and that makes it nice for comparative work. They forage widely for different seeds and fruits through the landscape. They're long-lived, large-brained, socially complex with a hierarchical social system in which mated pairs are maintained through time, often very long periods, years. And these are maintained within flocks and flocks joining into night roosts in a hierarchical system. Um, although I should point out that uh, the, the degree to which these associations at these different levels are permanent versus fluid is relatively poorly characterized, for, well, is beginning to be well characterized for only a handful of species. And finally, of course, they have extensive vocal learning. Uh, from captivity, we know that parrots of both sexes are capable of mimicry, and this mimicry is lifelong. And so this has driven my study of parrots in the wild, and I've been particularly interested in this species here, the yellow-naped Amazon, which is a champion mimic in captivity. In the wild, the yellow-naped Amazon is found in the same tropical dry forest of uh, Central America that the capuchin monkeys are found in. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not. Um, so here in the yellow shading are the dry forest habitats in Costa Rica, and this is uh, the same areas where Susan was showing that her study sites are. Here's a parrot's eye view of the tropical dry forest in Santa Rosa, one of the study sites where we work. Uh, you can see that this is at the transition from the wet season, which, during which trees are very well leafed, to the dry season when many trees lose their leaves and it becomes easier to see green parrots and follow them around. It's even easier to see them in the agricultural areas surrounding these regenerating forests. This, uh, in general, this habitat was cleared for forests uh, certainly over the last two centuries. But the parrots are doing pretty well in this habitat. In fact, they prefer to nest in isolated trees in, that have been left for shade in cattle pastures. Uh, I suspect that they're doing this in order to avoid predation by a number of predators, including uh, capuchin monkeys. So the nest sites are used year after year, and that provides one nice locus for trying to study interactions between different parrots. Another one are uh, these night roosts. So here, it's dark, so it's hard to see the parrots at night, but they're clustered up along the very top edge of this tree. These roosts can uh, include up to 200 or 300 birds at their peak size, and birds will disperse outward from these to forage uh, during the day and to attend nests. These roosts also occur in highly traditional locations. By this, I mean that the birds will come back to roost in the same trees night after night and in the same general area year after year. And this provides a very convenient way to survey populations for geographic variation. So in 1994, when I was beginning my PhD, I conducted this sort of ethnographic survey and recorded vocalizations at each of these 22 roosts spanning the range of the yellow-naped Amazon in Costa Rica. 
And when I started my survey, I have to say that I was initially rather disappointed by the results. I was expecting there to be strong differences between these very obvious night roosts. But in fact, I didn't find them. So here again are spectrograms and on the bottom uh, waveforms, time and the amplitude of the sound over time. And what we've got are six different contact calls. These are calls used very commonly by parrots while moving, uh, flying, or just uh, perched within the landscape. And we've got two different calls from each of two individuals at three different roosts. And when I play these, let's see how my thumb <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to the ear, they sound very similar. They all sound like wah-wahs to us, right? Uh, well, when I continued my survey and moved south, actually closer to uh, Loma Barbadol, we found very different style of contact call. So here, rather than the two-syllable wah-wah, we have a relatively uh, long, constant frequency introduction, then a sharp upward-downward modulation that sounds like wilip. <coughs> so again, we've got uh, calls from six different individuals. As I continued my survey up on the northern border of uh, Costa Rica with Nicaragua, I found a third dialect here represented at one roost. And this in structurally and to our ear has some similarities to the contact call found in the south, but it's separated by 60 kilometers. If you can play this. And finally, at uh, some roosts bordering the north and south dialect, we found some individuals that were bilingual. That is, they actually used both neighboring dialects interchangeably. So here are the contact calls now from a single individual calling first the uh, northern wah-wah and then a southern weep call. <laughs> so as you can hear, these are very distinctly one or the other type. They're not intermediates between these two different types. And so when we map these out uh, on these roosts, we find the classic mosaic dialect pattern. That is fairly constant form of a contact call and then sharp shifts to another contact call. So the reds here are all south dialect. The blues are all north dialect. The green is the one Nicaraguan dialect. These red diamonds indicate roost at, some, uh, roost at which some individuals were bilingual. But these were relatively rare. Only about 10 to 15% of birds at any one roost would be bilingual. And most of the birds here use the southern dialect. Later, uh, after publishing this, we found that there was another roost here, just to the north, at which most individuals use the north dialect, but there were a few bilingual individuals. So the border is really quite sharp between these two different dialects. We quantified this variation. So we didn't just uh, listen to the spectrograms. We quantified it using a technique called spectrographic cross-correlation, which is nice because it gives a single measure of overall call similarity. And when we map this out using multidimensional scaling here, each point represents the average calls of an individual, and the proximity between those points represents its similarity. And you can see that they group out ni quite nicely. Here are all the Nicaraguan calls, here are the northern calls, and here are the southern calls. If you're looking very closely, you can see that there's some symbols that appear in both. These are actually bilingual in, uh, birds giving either northern type calls or southern type calls. And, uh, to test the strength of this clustering pattern, we used Mantel test for matrix correlation, where we took our call similarity matrix, so all the pairwise comparisons of calls, and tested it against a matrix in which we had ones for comparisons between the same dialect and zeros for comparisons between different dialects, found a very strongly significant correlation between call similarity and the dialect structure. Not surprising, we can hear this with our own ears. We also found, looking within dialects, though, that there was some structuring by roosts. So within the northern dialect and within the southern dialect, there's a significant association of call structure by roost, although this structure is much more subtle. It's the fine structure within these changes in note types. So yellow-naped Amazons exhibit contact call dialects, much like uh, white-crowned sparrows exhibit uh, in their male song. One question I then wanted to ask was, were these really stable geographic phenomena uh, that were consistent over population, and indeed they were. So we went back and resurveyed these sites in 2005 over an 11-year span, and as you go through this, and I think we can play each one, you'll see that they sound very similar to our ear. And indeed, uh, if we go back even farther to calls recorded by Gary Stiles in 1982, we can hear similar calls as well. 
So over uh, almost a 20-year span then, 20, sorry, 23-year span, we can see that the dialect structure appears to be very similar. And when, when we map it out, sorry, yep, we can see that uh, the borders appear to be very similar as well. So here's 1994, I already showed you. Here's 2005. And while there's a little bit of change in the presence or absence of bilingual birds at this border, the border is, is virtually in the same place. A little change up here at the Nicaraguan border where we hadn't seen bilingual birds before. There now were bilingual birds here. We found a new roost at which there were bilingual birds and there's some northern birds up here where before there were just Nicaraguan. But overall, a picture of stability in dialect form and instability in the dialect borders. So why? Why do we see these sorts of stable uh, population level phenomenon? Why do we not see mixing of the different dialect types? Why do we not see change or loss of dialect form? Well, we can basically break the hypothesis down into two classes. One that, that suggests that there's limited dispersal of movement of individuals between different dialects. If, if the dialects don't mix at all, then there's no possibility of them changing. And this could be either through physical barriers or simply because the birds aren't welcome when they move from one dialect to another. Alternatively, there could be vocal convergence and learning going on. Birds may move from one dialect to another, but learn the new dialect when they arrive. And they could, might do this for a number of reasons, to get access to social groups, to actually form the pair bonds and mate, or perhaps to gain knowledge about distribution of resources that might be popping in and out at various times of the year. So we've addressed these hypotheses using two different techniques that make some nice strong predictions for what we expect to see. One is population genetics. We'd, if there's no dispersal between, of individuals between dialects, we expect to see um, excess genetic differences forming between dialects. That is, excess, uh, genetic differences in excess of what would be expected on the basis of distance alone. On the other hand, if birds are moving back and forth and mixing their genes, we don't expect to see genetic differences, but we do expect that vocal convergence will occur after movements. So we expect to see the learning that we think is underlying this entire system. So in order to do genetics, you need to collect genetic samples. And this is not necessarily always easy with parrots. The, they're smart birds, and they tend to laugh at the traditional style of catching birds, which is misnetting. Uh, luckily, they are, do nest in cavities, and they nest in the same cavities year after year, and we can find these cavities. And if those cavities aren't right, right next to the cavities occupied by killer bees, then we can climb up to them and collect chicks for sampling. And so that's, yeah, they're really cute, aren't they? Uh, that's where we uh, collect most of our samples is from chicks, which have the benefit of knowing where that individual started its life. And so we've uh, addressed this with two uh, different genetic markers, one with mitochondrial DNA sequences from the control region, and another uh, later study with microsatellites. Uh, and in both cases, we had sampling across uh, one dialect boundary, two different dialects. The results are very similar for both. In neither case do we see any evidence of genetic structuring along dialect lines. So here on the left is a uh, mitochondrial phylogeny, if you will, of different individuals. And individuals are coded by blue if they belong to the north and red if they belong to the south. So it looks like there's some split here, but these are all genetically identical individuals sharing the same haplotype. And as you go through the tree, you can see that any individual's closest genetic relative may be an individual <laughs> from another dialect. And any individual's closest geographic relative, so here's a North D individual and here's another North D individual, and they're on different clades of the tree, so they're genetically quite distinct. Likewise, when you look at uh, genetic distances between pairs of individuals, the pairs, the genetic distances based on microsatellites are no greater for pairs drawn from two different dialects than they are if they're a pair drawn from the same dialect, whether that be the North dialect or the South dialect. So the genetics suggest that there's lots of gene flow and lots of movement of individuals. Uh, my student, Alejandro Salinas Malgoza, has been doing a very difficult experiment now to try to confirm whether uh, vocal convergence could be underlying then the uh, maintenance of these dialects through time. And what he's doing is capturing birds using giant canopy mist nets and then moving them. And we either, uh, we radio collar them and then either move them across dialect boundaries into a new dialect or we move them an equivalent distance within the same dialect or we have same site controls that we just release at the same sites. 
We then have them radio collared, we monitor their social behavior, and we record their vocalizations. And our predictions are not just that birds will match the new call of the new group, but we also thought that social affiliation may be underlying this, and that social affiliation would increase after convergence. Well, again, initially our results were rather uh, not disappointing, but certainly not in the direction we expected. Uh, the controls that we moved within the north dialect, we didn't see any changes. So if they gave a north call before, they gave a north call afterwards. And this was true of, of a whole lot of birds. In the south, we moved birds from the north, uh, so, sorry, from the south to the north. Most of these birds also did not change their dialects. In fact, where we could continue uh, monitoring them, we found that many of them returned back to their original capture site 30 or 40 kilometers away. However, we did have one individual who showed the expected pattern of vocal convergence, or predicted pattern. So this individual was a juvenile that started with a south dialect, and after six weeks was giving a very credible imitation of a north dialect call. When we look at patterns of uh, social affiliation between these birds, we see some interesting patterns here. The non-convergent birds tended to stick with other south dialect birds that we had released into the flock. So that's the green bars here in weeks post-release. Uh, very few of them hung with north dialect birds only, which is the, the red bars. In contrast, the bird that did converge very quickly joined a, a north dialect group, stayed with that group. But this, interestingly, this uh, social affiliation preceded by several weeks any evidence of call matching. So call matching was not prerequisite to being able to join that social group. So to summarize then, uh, Yellow-naped Amazons have stable vocal traditions as seen in songbirds and certainly in humans as well. These dialects are likely maintained by vocal convergence by immigrants, but that is not necessarily an easy process. And we're not, still not clear on exactly what the selection pressures are that promote learned convergence. And so I'm going to end now just with these questions that I think uh, we'll carry on to tomorrow that we can ask about vocal traditions. What determines the stability and scale? What are the benefits of these sorts of vocal traditions? What constrains them? What sort of mechanisms may be underlying their acquisition? And what sort of commonalities we see between the vocal traditions of birds and humans? And I'll end there. Thank you. At the start of this, I'll point out that I do not work on parrots. I do work on marine mammals, but I'll try to draw some parallels between uh, these different groups. And I'll be discussing a much more fine-grained and process-oriented view of the origins of culture uh, than either Tim Wright or Hal Whitehead. I think it's very useful to have these different perspectives at the same time. I'd also like to second Jim Moore's call to broaden our comparative perspective to new species. Uh, I'd also I'd include, for example, animals like elephants as in this kind of category that uh, Susan mentioned earlier. Uh, my focus uh, is on vocal learning, uh, as Tim described. That's the capacity to learn to produce new sounds based on hearing the sounds of others. A vocal learning is essential for the components of culture that are expressed by vocal communication. Uh, since it's relatively rare among non-human primates, those who work with primates may be less familiar with it. But there are other groups of animals which show great skills in vocal learning. And some of the strongest evidence for vocal learning comes from reports to train captive animals to use artificial signals. I'll give an example. Alex, what matter? Meaning, what is it made of? Whoa. That's right, you're a good Alex boy. can answer different questions about the same object. Come on, how many corners? What shape? What shape? Four. Corner. Four corner, good boy. Alex hasn't just learned to say a certain word when he sees Look a particular object. He's how paying many? attention to the questions. How many? Wow. That's right. You're a good boy. So there's an example where humans have asked the animal to adapt to our system. And we can get a sense of their capabilities, both of imitation and labeling. Uh, similar work was done by Lou Herman in the University of Hawaii and his colleagues 
in the 1980s in which uh, they would uh, train a dolphin in captivity to imitate a computer-generated sound. So here is a spectrogram or a plot of frequency against time of a tone generated by a computer, like, woo, whoop, like that. And here's the dolphin's imitation. You can see the pattern is quite similar. Here's an unmodulated sound lower in frequency, like whoop, and the dolphin can't make it perfect, but it's much less modulated. And here's a square wave, which the animal is a little rougher at. But you can see the animal is, is doing a pretty good job at Im imitating the sounds. And if you ask an observer to, to compare the, the imitation to the different models, they can easily uh, correctly classify them. <coughs> Uh, once uh, Doug Richards had done this training in Lou's lab, he realized what he could do is train an animal on a vocal labeling test. So for this computer-generated sound I showed you before, what they would do is when the dolphin had a ball in the pool, they'd put the ball in, the dolphin would be playing with the ball, and they would play this sound. So the animal learned to associate this sound with the ball, and this woo 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 sort of more rapidly oscillating call was associated in this case with a frisbee. Then for the test, after the training, what they could do is throw the ball in the water, and the job for the dolphin was to make the sound that had been associated with the ball. And if you threw the frisbee in the water, their job was to make the frisbee-like sound. And dolphins can do this exceedingly well with a, with a relatively small amount of training. So they're able to use an artificial man-made sound that they can produce themselves to label an arbitrary man-made object. Uh, in, in general, these animal language experiments have demonstrated both interesting capabilities of imitation for vocal learning and of labeling. Uh, and I just said these, these topics. I don't think I need to say more about it, other than the lab is a useful setting to be able to demonstrate the imitation and vocal learning for sure with artificial signals. That's harder in uh, the wild. And it's, it is a, a relatively short-term learned tradition that participants can use to communicate across species. So in that sense, it's a shared animal and human culture. However, my bias, my training is in ethology, and my bias is, is that to understand the evolutionary origins of the skills, uh, we really need studies of animals in the wild of the sort that you heard from both Susan and Tim. So one question is, is there evidence for vocal learning in natural settings? The Indian hill mina is a bird that's quite an accomplished vocal mimic in, uh, the, in uh, captive settings, and the first studies of this bird in the wild provided very little evidence for vocal learning. So, so you really want to look at where does it occur. When you do find animals imitating sounds in the wild, what are the functions of vocal learning? How do animals use these skills in their own cultures and their own learned communication systems? And are there commonalities between species that have independently evolved vocal learning? Uh, Susan showed uh, her taxonomic chart. Y you could view this for a variety of these traits we're interested in. What are the commonalities among species that have com come up with these uh, unusual traits? The broader a taxonomic perspective, the more different uh, independent groups we have to look at, the better our analysis will be. And I think we're very limited if we, if we limit ourselves to primates. Uh, here's an example of uh, vocal labeling from untrained but captive uh, parrots. These are spectacled parrotlets uh, studied by Vanker in Germany. And what he did was he took recordings of parrotlets uh, when they were, uh, could see one other bird and only one other bird. So, but, uh, uh, and could, I'm uh, sorry, could, were in the same room as another bird, could not see, but could vocally communicate. So they could hear each other and not see each other. And what he found was that when the same individual, these are all spectrograms from the same individual, when this animal was communicating with its mate, it produced a call like, ooh, ooh, ooh like that. And here's another example of that same call. When it was communicating with one offspring, it, went, it made a sound like ooh, 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 like that, which is very similar down below. With another offspring, it made a different signal. So basically, he found that, each each, that when this individual bird was interacting with a specific other individual, it had an individual distinctive contact call that it could use for that specific individual. And the other individuals recognize when they're hearing the call that's specific for them. He discovered that from playback experiments. So that's quite similar from the vocal labeling experiments I showed that Lou Herman's group did with dolphins. The, the psychologists seemed obsessed by objects. What the animals are telling us is the natural labels are the names of social partners or social groups. That's the more common thing we're seeing from untrained animals. 
to now go into the wild uh, to look at uh, some of the background of some of the animals in the wild, I'll be discussing another parrot that comes from the uh, dry forest around Guanacaste province in Costa Rica. This is the orange-fronted conure studied by Jack Bradbury's group. And the most uh, stable groups in, in this species are mated pairs. That's quite common across parrots and sibling groups. So the strongest and most stable group is the mated pair. And during the se breeding season, pairs depend, de defend their nests against many other parrots. So they, they have to rely on each other in this, in this somewhat risky defense. Uh, they'll lay up to five eggs in a nest, uh, one after another, and the, and the birds that, the, that hatch from these eggs form a sibling group that forages with the parents for a few months until they join other groups to form foraging groups of 10 to 20 birds. Among these foraging groups, though, each night, parrots w of a couple different foraging groups will roost apparently in a different tree, according to the work of Bradbury's group. So what that suggests is that you have quite fluid groupings in the night roosts, very stable mated pair bonds, and intermediate stability in the foraging groups. So you have very, some very stable, individual-specific social relationships within fluid groupings, where animals that share relationships need to depend on each other. Uh, within this, this species, these are four um, uh, contact calls from four different individual orange-fronted con uh, orange conures. And in this case, the overall gestalt of the calls may be somewhat similar. I hope it's obvious to everybody that, say, compared to the dialects that Tim showed, these are quite, each one of these is quite different. So this has an upsweep and two of these humps. This has an upsweep and one uh, hump here. This has two shorter humps. They're quite easy to distinguish. If we look at bottlenose dolphin societies, they also show strong bonds within fluid groups. The details are different. So it, it, uh, in dolphins groupings, they seem to have a fission fusion pattern of fluid groupings that change constantly, even on a minute by minute basis. There's no evidence for paternal care, but the young are dependent on the mother for three to five years. And as Susan mentioned, as males mature, they form quite strong bonds, associating almost all the time with one or two other males. And, and these male coalitions uh, rely on each other for very important cooperation. And within these fluid groupings in dolphins, the strongest bonds are between the mother and the young for a period of dependency of a few years, and male alliances that may last for decades. Here are some examples of contact calls used by dolphins. This is the very early figure by uh, David and Milba Caldwell from the 60s. Uh, these are from common dolphins, and these are uh, animals from captivity. Uh, when these animals were recorded, this, this is a, a, a call from one dolphin. It was like, ooh, and here's one from another one, ooh, like that. These calls are so distinctive that when you know the animal and you hear it, you immediately know who it is. Uh, it's uh, as easy to distinguish as species for songbirds that you know. Uh, on the other hand, it's quite hard to distinguish species. I couldn't tell you this was a common dolphin versus a uh, bottlenose dolphin. And if we look at the functions of when these uh, calls are used, they're called, uh, uh, often called uh, cohesion calls or contact calls. Uh, they're not used randomly to maintain contact during separation. This is a plot from a lot of focal follow data uh, looking at separations of animals from the start of a separation, however long it lasted, to the end, and from being together to as far away as the animals got. And the open circles mark random timing. The, the dark uh, circles mark actual times when the animals whistled. You'll see there are quite a f very few whistles made during the time animals are separating. As soon as they start whistling, the animals stop separating. So they use this call to, to slow down the separation process, but they don't immediately come together. They don't have to immediately come together. They do continue calling during the time when they come back together again. And playback experiments show that dolphins in the wild, but in a rather artificial capture setting, uh, and uh, uh, parrots, respond preferentially to the animals they share strong bonds with. So in a matched kind of playback setting, if you play back the sound, the call of an animal that the animal has a strong bond with, it will show a stronger response to that than to a call from this, an animal of the same age sex class that it's not very closely related to. So they recognize these individually distinctive signals that look quite different. Uh, uh, we've heard a little bit about convergence of calls 
as animals form stable groups. And this is present also in both in different parrot groups and marine mammal groups. In Bajerigar, Bajerigars, Susan Farabaugh showed uh, that when males are caged, uh, when animals are caged together, in this case all males, uh, it, this is the same kind of plot of a spectrogram cross correlation. Uh, against multidimensional scaling that Tim showed, and the letter corresponds to each individual. So these are calls of one male, another male, another male before they're housed together. They haven't heard each other. After eight uh, weeks of being caged together, here's an, here the animals have converged into three different converged call types. In dolphins, as males form an alliance over a period of one to three years, their signature whistles converge. Here's uh, one example of a, of a pair of uh, alliance partners here, and here's another pair of alliance partners. And this is actually quite com this is a, the most common form of vocal learning we know of. This is the only example I'm aware of that's shown for non-human primates. So for, uh, th there are uh, some non-human primates that when caged together like this will show, show some evidence for vocal convergence as they form groups. So it's a rather widespread phenomenon, probably more so than the individual specific calls that I showed. When you look at playback experiments uh, for these kinds of uh, individually distinctive contact calls, uh, both in, in dolphins and in parrots, we're starting to see some quite interesting examples. So here's an example from Balsby and Bradbury from this year, in which the, uh, as, as a group of, as a parrot flew overhead, they would play one of these contact calls over and over again. And this is the um, uh, multidimensional scaling analysis of the spectrogram correlation for similarity of the stimulus against the responses of the bird as it's flying overhead. So it starts with a call that's pretty different from the stimulus. There's the stimulus. Here's its, the second response, which it seems pretty far away. And you can tell just looking at it, they're not very similar. But as it keeps, continues calling, it gets closer, it moves away a little bit, then gets then bang on by the ninth call here. He gets one that's pretty similar to the stimulus call. And then it deviates away. And uh, Balsby and Bradbury found variation in the, in the responses of the animals of either converging or diverging in their response to these playbacks. Now, the playback's probably a little bit stupid. It's just the same call over and over. The parrots are probably much more sophisticated. And so we're just beginning to gain entry into what this means. And here's an example of vocal matching in wild dolphins, not from a playback experiment. This is from Vincent Yannick. He set up three hydrophones or underwater microphones in an area where dolphins were feeding. And here's a case where one dolphin was here, another dolphin was here, another dolphin was here. And this dolphin produced an upsweep, downsweep call. And with a time delay uh, that was very short, uh, so it, had, it couldn't have been produced by, this, by the same animal, a second animal, D D D2, produced the same whistle. And here's a third animal producing it. So we see similar kinds of immediate vocal matching in the wild, where we don't know exactly whose signature whistle is which, but we see vocal matching in interactions uh, among animals out of sight of one another. In captivity, when we look at animals uh, in isolation, we can identify their signature whistles when an or individual distinctive contact calls. When these animals are isolated away from other animals, the d predominant call will be an individually distinctive call that's different from others. So here's data from two animals in captivity, Spray, who had a slow decline and slow increase in her signature whistle, and Scotty, who, who had much more rapid uh, modulation. And you can, here's a case of Scotty imitating Spray's call and Spray's imitating Scotty's call. What about the functions? What do these tell us about the functions of vocal matching? I'll say right now, we're at the point of hypotheses. We do not know the answers to these questions. But one qu question, one hypothesis, is does a, hypoth does a dolphin imitate the whistle of another individual to initiate a social interaction with that specific individual? Or in the case of the parrotlets, does the parrotlet make a particular individual, the, his own call for a particular individual to initiate an interaction? And in these groups of parrot exchanges, uh, the way these exchanges involve converging patterns and then diverging patterns suggests to Balsby and Bradbury that rather than just a simple cohesion effect, maybe these exchanges reflect a negotiation about whether to join. 
And so imagine you've got a, gr a, a small foraging group of these orange-fronted conures coming down. They're trying to decide who to join for a night roost. The night, you choose your night roost to avoid predation. They're quite vulnerable to predators in these areas. You really have to depend on these other groups being reliable. We don't, we don't know now about what the content of the negotiation would be, but it's possible that these vocal exchanges during the daytime when it's safe to do it are sort of a pro probing of a negotiation about which groups they might want to roost with or not. And to close, I'd just like to suggest that, that we have very radically different patterns of vocal communication, particularly among mammals, but also among the different uh, bird groups that Tim mentioned, some with, some without vocal learning. Uh, there are closed systems of vocal communication that, that are predominate among most mammals. Most mammals have a fixed vocal repertoire of signals. The motor pattern for producing each vocalization is inherited. This is a very limited communication system compared to the kind of thing I've been describing. And there are some other kinds of animals, and, and dolphins, parrots, uh, are only, I'm only using as a sort of an example of, um, of these groups. Sorry, there we go. Uh, dolphins and some birds maintain the ability to learn new vocalizations throughout the lifetime. Dolphins and avian, dolphin and avian vocal repertoires can be open and can differ between individuals. And we know at least from the captive work that dolphins and parrots can learn to associate novel reference with these novel learned vocalizations. Let's just suggest that these skills are critical for cultural exchanges that depend upon vocal communication. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, as the co-director of Carta, I've taken the liberty of attaching a small additional item to the program. But as you see, it is relevant. And this is the Museum of Comparative Anthropogeny. Anthropogeny, as you've heard, is the investigation of the origin of humans. Now, a transdisciplinary approach to anthropogeny needs to take into account that uh, we have our closest uh, evolutionary relatives, the great apes, with whom we share a common ancestor, and that we need to take fossil and archaeological data to consider how these uh, groups separated. And meanwhile, of course, take into account physical, biological, and cultural environment and their impact on these species. Of course, within each species, we need to consider the ontogeny of the individual from infant to adult and the interactions of uh, various parties together. But last but not least, of course, we need to compare things. We need to compare humans with great apes, and great apes with other primates and with other animals. And this is where MOCA comes in, the Museum of Comparative Anthropogeny. And this is a project that uh, people involved in Carter have been working on for more than 10 years, and it's quite incomplete, but we decided to just release it, uh, as they say, if you love something, let it go. <laughs> so if you want to find Mocha, actually, it's quite easy. Just uh, type in Mocha Carta into Google, and you'll get it. And here it is, going off screen here. Uh, the Museum of Comparative Anthropogeny is a collection of comparative information regarding humans and our closest evolutionary relatives with an emphasis on uniquely human features. Comparison of these non-human hominids with humans are difficult because so little is known about their phenotypic features and in contrast to humans. And ethical, physical, and practical issues limit the collection of further information. So MOCA simply attempts to collect existing information about human-specific differences from these great apes currently scattered in the literature. It's felt that having this information in one location could lead to new insights and multidisciplinary interactions and to ethically sound studies to explain these differences. So MOCA is organized by domains, with each grouping representing areas of interest in scientific discipline. And each topic entry will eventually cover existing information about a particular difference, alleged or documented, between humans and these non-human hominids. Well, there are many frequently asked questions about MOCA, and I'll just address a couple of them. Uh, what are the criteria for including a topic in MOCA? 
Well, basically, a known, apparent, or claimed human-specific difference from other hominids, the so-called great apes, with an emphasis on human uniqueness, because that's the question. Such topics can range from molecular to organismal to societal. And the difference in question uh, does not have to be universal to all humans, but as Don Brown said, it needs to be universal to human populations. And in deciding whether a topic should be included, uh, the MOCA editors also consider whether the topic might be relevant to understanding human origins. Let's go back to the fact there. And the final issue I'll address is, uh, why is MOCA called a museum and not an encyclopedia or a database? This is because MOCA is not targeted at experts, but rather aims to communicate basic information to scientists in many disciplines and to other interested readers. So MOCA also includes topics for which popular wisdom about claimed or assumed differences is not entirely correct. So for all these reasons, MOCA is called a museum and it's not an encyclopedia or database. So like a museum, it is meant to be an inviting place for people to browse and think, perhaps provoking further discussion or research or providing feedback. So with that uh, very general introduction to MOCA, I'll invite uh, Pascal Gagneau to just give a small tour of just a couple of examples. Good afternoon. It's, it is my pleasure to give you a brief panoramic view of MOCA. Have you, as you've heard, um, as Ajit Varki mentioned, uh, we have organized over 500 topics into currently 24 domains of knowledge, which include uh, mental disease, anatomy and biomechanics, general life history, genomics, pharmacology, ecology, skin biology, communication, reproductive biology, social organization, genetics, nutrition, organ physiology, medical disease, neuroscience, immunology, development, dental biology, pathology, cognition, endocrinology, cell biology and biochemistry, behavior, and today's uh, symposium topic, culture. Let's go and visit uh, culture. So we return to the MOCA main site. We visit the domains, and we can choose the domain culture with a long list of topics that uh, each topic representing a, a, um, a confirmed or alleged difference of uh, unique human traits. Uh, it's about that time of the day, five o'clock-ish. Let's go and visit cuisine. Uh, each topic is, uh, <clears throat> is cross-listed, so we can go from the, the domain culture, the topic cuisine, to a related topic, anti-nutrients, under nutrition. And of course, you've heard today from Don Brown uh, the importance of fire in a facilitator, indirect facilitator of cultural change and cultural transmission. So a lot of what humans do to get rid of anti-nutrients has to do with cooking and changing, denaturing proteins and so forth. That is done by the use of fire, which is cross-listed here and takes us back to the domain culture. Uh, here's the entry for fire. You'll notice two things. In this case, the uh, MOCA topic author is an anonymous author. And the other, other thing you may have noticed is that we have been using different fonts for these different topics. What is this about? We can go back to the MOCA frequently asked questions. First, let's address the three font system. The idea is to dramatically cut back on the, the need for qualifiers by using three fonts that indicate the level of certainty of each statement. In bold font, we have statements that are generally true based on current, current information. In, uh, in plain font, we have statements that are likely based on uh, available information. And in smaller courier font, we have explicit speculation. So an example would be that we humans shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees and bonobos, who are our closest living relatives, uh, this common ancestor li likely existed 67 million years ago. It is unclear, however, uh, whether the common ancestor was more similar to a chimpanzee or a bonobo or equally different from both, as uh, the recent description of uh, Ardipithecus ramidus tends to suggest. Finally, the question of the anonymous author. 
why is it that some topics are, are um, entered by an anonymous author? Uh, given the right range of topics, uh, it will take some time to engage the best experts to write each topic. So several of the topics have been written by current MOCA editors uh, with some knowledge of the subject, and that's why they remain anonymous. <laughs> you can, by the way, uh, send feedback to each topic. You need to register on the site for that. Finally, uh, when is MOCA going to be completed? By definition, MOCA is a perpetual work in progress. New information, new topics, possibly new domain will need to be added as these get discovered. And I'd like to end by uh, once again thanking uh, our sponsors, the Mathis Foundation of New York and Annette C. Merle Smith. I'd like also to thank all the MOCA leaders, the topic authors, and the editors, a large group of people that have contributed to this initial uh, com compilation that I think is, is unique and will hopefully trigger much interest, much feedback uh, from all over the world. This would have been impossible without uh, John Moreland and Chaitan Baru of the San Diego Supercomputer Center and Cal IT2 that are essentially the brains behind the, uh, the, the, this website. And of course, without the Carter team, uh, Linda Carlson and Amy Patterson who made all this possible.